Welcome to What Catholics Believe. I'm your host, Julius Smetona. Today, we're going to be discussing a topic which has been before the news in an almost spectacular way. Our topic is what Catholics believe about ecumenism. Our guest is the Reverend William Jenkins, former professor of philosophy at St. Thomas Aquinas Seminary in Ridgefield, Connecticut. Father Jenkins, welcome back once again Thank to you. what Catholics Thank believe. You. Father, what is the Church's definition or view of ecumenism? Well, ecumenism, as it is understood by the Catholic Church, is the attempt to explain the faith in such a way that those who do not have the faith can understand it and appreciate the truth to it. Uh, it is a kind of apologetic approach. Uh, unfortunately, today, that uh, concept of ecumenism has been perverted. And the concept of ecumenism today, which we might call false ecumenism, holds that all religions are basically true and good and all acceptable to God to one degree or another. And it doesn't really matter what you believe in well, the eyes of God. What does the Catholic Church teach? Does it teach that all religions aren't good, only some religions are good? The Catholic Church teaches, actually, that there is only one true religion, and that is the Catholic religion. In fact, the Church would be dishonest if she did not teach that, if she did not believe that. You know, if there was one Lord, one faith, and one baptism, as St. Paul tells us, and which we believe, then there can be one church. Christ did not establish a thousand churches, a hundred churches, or even two churches. He referred to what he called his church, one flock under one shepherd. And so we as Catholics believe that uh, Jesus Christ established one church, that that church still exists, and that church is historically to this day the Roman Catholic Church. Do you Catholic, do Catholics believe that they may learn nothing, for instance, from any Protestant group? Well, the Catholic Church can certainly learn nothing in terms of supernatural truth from any other religion. Because we have the teachings of Christ, we have sacred scripture, we have sacred tradition in the Catholic Church, we have the guidance of the Holy Ghost. There are things that can be learned as far as approach and methods and so on, <coughs> how, to, how to talk about the faith, how to spread the faith. But in terms of supernatural truth, no. The Church cannot learn anything from any other religion. Historically, <laughs> what have been the relations between, say, the Catholic Church and other religions? Perhaps you can even tell us at what point did uh, more than one Christian religion actually develop? Well, for the first centuries after Christ, the Church was under the guidance of the apostles initially, and then under the men whom the apostles chose to be bishops and the successor of St. Peter, the Pope, the Bishop of Rome. And they had the benefit of the writing of the fathers of the church <coughs> during this time. And all during this time, there was heretical ferment. Even during the time of St. John, the apostle, who wrote the fourth gospel, there were heretics springing up. And we're talking about the 90s A.D. Uh, John actually encountered one of these apostles of heresy in the streets of Ephesus one day and would not even greet him and in fact wouldn't even enter into the same public building with him as he said for fear that the walls would collapse and the building would crush them all. This, this attitude, if I may interrupt, seems not very evangelical because our Lord was accused of eating with sinners mm. and here he apparently didn't St. John wasn't following the master's precepts. Yeah, if you look at the sinners with whom our Lord ate though there were sinners who knew they were sinners and were sorry they were sinners and were looking for a savior. Uh, it's the Pharisees he could not uh, accommodate because of their pride. He came looking for those sinners who were humble but then look at King David. David did some terrible things but he was still beloved of God because he was humble and he repented of his sins. He asked forgiveness and he made amends. And so when our Lord came, uh, he treated the sinners of his own day in the same way. As long as they were humble, acknowledged their sin, and repented and wanted to make amends, he was a loving and forgiving Lord for them. But, uh, you know, St. John the Evangelist, who was known as the Apostle of Love, the beloved disciple, uh, the one who says God is love, was the same one who says, do not even greet a heretic. 
And uh, so well, what is interesting is that the heresies were arising already against the church while one of the apostles was still alive. And they had the audacity to stand up publicly and confront one of the apostles and say, no, we know what Jesus taught, you don't. <laughs> Just as people stand up now after all of these centuries and say, no, we know what Jesus taught, you, the Catholic Church, doesn't know. Now, our Catholic Church is the only church that goes back to the very beginning, it goes right back to Calvary. We know where our church has come from. It was not established by a mere man. It was established by Christ. The other so-called Christian religions later cropped up centuries after, after Christ. As a matter of fact, the, the presently existing Christian religions that we know as Protestantism did not see the light of day until 1,500 years after our Lord Jesus Christ was born. Well, Father, you got up to this point now, and, and perhaps you can answer the second part of my question. Historically, what was the relationship between the Catholic Church then and these other Christian religions? If well, they were breakoffs. They broke away. They broke away because they did not want to uh, follow dogmas of the Church, which had been doctrines of the Church from the very beginning. Uh, they invented doctrines of their own. They said that the sacred scriptures were the only source of divine truth, and they went into the sacred scripture and said, now it's up to each individual to decide for himself what the scriptures mean, and what effectively what they did was they made every man a religion unto himself, and every man became his own pope. So instead of having one pope in Rome, they had thousands and thousands of popes, each of them saying, well, this is what I understand the scripture to say, therefore this is divine truth for me. Well, it wasn't one of the criticisms of the Protest, early Protestants of the Catholic Church, that the Catholic Church wasn't scriptural and it wasn't following the Bible. Yeah, well, that's a criticism that is very easy to make. Mm -hmm. But basically what they're saying is this. They're saying that the Catholic Church does not teach what I believe. Mm -hmm. And I interpret the Bible differently, and therefore the Catholic Church is not following the Bible, I am. They're saying that the Catholic Church does not teach what I believe. Mm -hmm. And I interpret the Bible differently, and therefore the Catholic Church is not following the Bible. I am. Hi, this is Rustic. It's still shadows. I had to copy that and play it twice back to back for you because that is so key. It's so vital that we recognize the fact that Christ gave his apostles authority to teach his truth. Just read the first chapter of Acts. He was here for 40 days before Christ ascended into heaven. And he was instructing his apostles. He told them to go out and teach the gospel and preach it and ordain. Not just anybody can create their own church with their own doctrine. And once you get into that... Don't you find yourself bouncing around from one perspective to another? Do you have an anchor of truth? Where has truth originated? That needs to be the focus. And you'll find that it's in the Catholic ancient church that was started by the apostles and can be documented as truth said, teach them all I have commanded you. He commanded them. They commanded their successors. Wouldn't you really like to know the church that Christ established? The one that will not be overtaken? The one that evil shall not prevail against? The rock? If you really love Jesus, yes, you do then. Think about it, you do. You want to be on the Ark of Christ. His church. Got it? Just think about it. Meditate on it. He'll show you. That's basically what Martin Luther was saying. Uh, Martin Luther went so far as to tear pages out of the Bible. Pages that said things he didn't agree with, like the Epistle of St. James. He said, this is an epistle of straw. It does not teach my doctrine. And he tore it out and he threw it away. He said it's to be burned. And the same with some of the other books of the Bible, just because they didn't teach his doctrine. Now, what the, doc the teaching of Martin Luther was not God-revealing, but Martin Luther reveling 
basically, mm -hmm. in his own imaginings, in his own interpretation of Scripture. What did the uh, Protestants, how did they view tradition as a source of revelation? If I just may digress from our main point just for a moment, what, how do they look upon tradition as a source of revelation? Well, the Protestants do not accept tradition as a source of revelation. As I say, they accept uh, sacred scripture alone mm -hmm. as the standard of divine truth. Now, how therefore is it possible for, we, for us as Catholics to speak on a common basis with them? Well, we look at sacred scripture and we appeal to the interpretation of sacred scripture, not that we make up as individuals how we would like to interpret these things, but we go back to the teachings of the fathers of the church. In other words, we appeal to the faith of the first Christians. And we say, these are the men who received the faith from the apostles. What did they believe? Do we believe the same thing that they believed? Do we believe what the first Christians believed about the Blessed Virgin? Do we believe what the first Christians believed about the Holy Eucharist and the Mass, about purgatory, indulgences, and so on? Do we believe the same? If we believe the same as they believed, we believe the teachings of Christ. Protestants don't do that. They don't regard this. And it's interesting that any Protestant who has looked back at the teaching of the early centuries of the Church has found Catholicism there. And many of them have converted. Uh, just one more moment on this point. How can you just, the, the church then claims uh, revelation comes from two fonts, tradition and scripture. The Protestants then seem to say revelation comes from scripture alone, interpreted by each man individually. Could you give an example of a truth which Catholics believe which is based upon tradition? And could you justify tradition as a source of revelation? Well, we're getting a little bit far afield from the topic, which is a matter of ecumenism, mm -hmm. right? Uh, as far as uh, a doctrine that would um, be based very heavily on Catholic tradition, I would say the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception or the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary into Heaven. Okay. When you go back into the writings of the early fathers of the Church, you find a very, very strong, strong basis for what was the early Christian belief, <clears throat> that Mary was preserved free from sin, that Mary was assumed into Heaven. You can go back to some of the ancient monuments of the Christian faith, uh, and you will see depictions of Mary's body being taken up into Heaven. Mm -hmm. you know? but. The fact is that sacred scripture also implicitly teaches this same doctrine. There's absolutely no contradiction here. Now, the problem is when we get to the, to the question of ecumenism. <clears throat> when you're dealing with, with uh, groups that see the scriptures as the only source or the only depository of divine truth, and uh, who spurn tradition as being the uh, invention of man, purely of man, where do you start? Where do you go from there? Well, there are two different approaches you can take, one of them two and one of them false. The true approach is to prove from Scripture, in other words, take what they do believe and work from there to establish what they do not believe. You know? I think St. Thomas Aquinas said that if you, could find, if you found someone who believed one sentence of sacred Scripture is infallibly true, you could prove the truthfulness of the whole Scriptures to him and then the whole complexes of the faith, if he would accept one part of it. That is the true ecumenism, to work from what they do believe to what they don't believe and try to explain and, and increase their faith uh, so that they finally come to the fullness of, of the doctrines of the faith. Mm -hmm. Now, the false ecumenism is to say, well, this is what they believe, this is what they don't believe, and they don't like what they don't believe, so we just sort of push this away. And we say, well, this really doesn't count. You don't have to believe this. Let's concentrate on what you do believe and say that we're basically in agreement with each other, and that's a lie. Uh -huh. Let's, this, I think, brings us up to the present day. Uh, I think we've laid the groundwork then for the historical ecumenism and both the false and the true ecumenism. Now, we see before us, uh, especially by the hierarchy of the church, uh, attempts at reconciliation where it seems that they're saying, well, yes, in times we've, we've had these gulfs and we've been certainly uh, almost a, a wall 
has separated us. Now we're trying to tear this wall down, see what's in common. Uh, you don't find these current attempts, for instance, to be traditional or Catholic? No, no, it's false ecumenism, because it, it partakes of that same idea. What we don't believe, play down. And this has been done in the liturgy. Uh, a Protestant could go to a new Mass and find nothing offensive there. There's nothing in the new Mass that he could not interpret in a Lutheran sense, you see. And so there have been Protestant uh, Lutheran ministers who have used the new liturgy, uh, the new Mass, uh, from time to time and find nothing wrong with it. Now, that's ecumenism at its worst. Uh, ecumenism has a long history, by the way, this false ecumenism. Uh, even back in uh, the 1890s, Pope Leo XIII wrote uh, to this country, to the hierarchy of our United States of America, uh, documents Testem Benevolentiae and Longinqua Oceani. <clears throat> and he talked about uh, the uh, complexus of, of ideas that he called Americanism. <clears throat> he didn't say they were a heresy, but he said they were very dangerous tendencies. One of them was to try to ingratiate the church to the Protestants in this country by playing down the doctrines that the Protestants didn't like. And he condemned that. He said, that's wrong. You have to preach the doctrines of the church uh, boldly and confidently and charitably and uh, take the consequences. Could but you, you cannot dissimulate. What are some uh, concrete examples of false ecumenism today? Is, is, does well, Julius, let's go right to the heart of the matter. Go right to the top. At Vatican II, a bishop got up in front of the 2,000-some bishops who were standing there, or seated there, at this ecumenical council. During the debate on the document, The Church in the Modern World, and this bishop, in order to convince the others not to come out in that document, be too strong, saying the Catholic Church is the only true religion and so on, this is what he said to them. It is not the place of the church to teach unbelievers. Wait, wait a minute. This seems to violate exactly Let what Let me Christ finish said. the statement. Yeah. It is not the place of the church to teach unbelievers. The church must seek with the rest of the world. Now, here you have a very strange thing. And anybody who had any concept of Catholicism would have to sit there dumbfounded and not believe his ears. A bishop who was a successor of the apostles, who were told by Christ, going therefore, make disciples of all nations, teaching them the gospel, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, and he who does not believe will be condemned. The man who was the successor of those who were commanded by Christ to do that stands up in front of all of the bishops of the world and says, it is not the place of the church to teach unbelievers. How is this possible? <clears throat> the same man later on goes over on and traveling around the world. And he talks about the rosary, talks about the Holy Eucharist, and says many Catholic things that sound very, very good. But when he's over in, let's say, New Guinea or someplace like that, he actually goes to visit snake worshipers, and he bows down to receive their blessing. And they say they're driving the devil out of him by their blessing. He goes and visits a Hindu temple, and he bows again and lets them anoint his forehead, forehead with ashes offered to the Hindu god, Vishnu. Uh, he goes to the Jewish synagogue, and while at the Jewish synagogue on a visit of state, he mentions the name of Jesus twice and never calls him Christ. What's the significance of this, never calling him Christ? Well, you tell me. What would that mean? Well, what would a Catholic, when he makes public statements, and uh, deliberately, because the statement was very well prepared, he refrains from referring to Jesus as Christ. Well, what does that tell you? Well, that's a very, it's a scandalous thing. It's scandalous to do that. <clears throat> um, this very same man later on called a conference of religions to a sissy, and he gives a Catholic church to Buddhists for their worship, and he allows the Buddhists to put a statue of Buddha on the tabernacle and to burn incense to it and to worship their god, Buddha, on top of the tabernacle in a Catholic church. How is this possible? 
Well, you, you that see, is that is the kind of ecumenism that is absolutely horrible, and has been condemned by the church. Well, you seem to be referring to John Paul II. Well, unfortunately, it is John Paul II who has done these things. And if you were to ask me, how can a Catholic pope do these things, I would tell you, I don't know. But I do know that the actions have been condemned by 20 centuries of Catholic life. Well, what, if the pope apparently is doing these things and his actions were condemned and he's doing what's condemned, what, what are we to make of his situation? <laughs> You tell me. It's a very, very confusing, uh, it's, it's actually a heart-wrenching situation for Catholics today. They don't know what to make of this, and they see someone they perceive as being a good and conservative pope, and in many ways, you know, that's, that's the, the message, that's how it comes across. They see the message that basically all religions have truth and goodness in them and are somehow acceptable to God, and they learn from this, but they learn a message that the church has condemned. Would John Paul II then believe that the church is the one true religion? Well, I'm sure that if you were to ask him, is the Catholic Church the one true church, is the Catholic faith the one true faith, he would say yes. Remember what we said about modernists, though. And speaking in this official capacity, I say this. And speaking in another official capacity, I can deny it. Look. To get up in front of all the bishops and say, and this is well documented, it is not the place of the church to teach unbelievers. Well, it's heresy. Well, it's, it's certainly very, very wrong. And, you know, if you, you'd have to investigate it and interpret it. Now, it's not your place and my place to sit here and to pronounce heresy on people. We don't have the authority to do that. But we still do recognize personally something that is extremely wrong and is not in harmony with the Catholic faith if it is the way it appears to be. And that's it. That's why we don't have the ability to judge infallibly these things. We don't. I'm not the Pope. What? And neither are you. Yeah. But my point is this. I'm not even a cleric, I mean, let alone the Pope. Well, <laughs> whether, even if you were a Catholic <laughs> cleric, you still would not be able to pronounce on anything right. like this infallibly. Well, but the point is, it's scandalous. It is at least scandalous. And... Uh, the, the, the impression that is given is that all religions are, are basically good and acceptable. The Catholic religion is the best of all the religions, which is like saying Christ is the best of all the gods, basically. <laughs> Let me give you an example. One more, and I'll try to be brief on this. When you ask, would the Pope say that the Catholic religion is the one true religion? I say yes. Well, I would refer you to Vatican II, the documents of Vatican II. The last document approved was the document on religious liberty. Now, if you were to read the first two sections of that document, you would say, this is straight out of the Baltimore Catechism. <clears throat> the Catholic Church is the one true church of Jesus Christ. The Catholic faith is the one true faith. Everyone must conform his conscience to this faith to please God. Fine. As soon as that's over with, <clears throat> the document launches into a doctrine that is absolutely foreign to Catholic teaching, which has been condemned by the Church. Uh, and uh, and the, the, the Council actually says that this doctrine is taught by the Gospel. Mm -hmm. And what the doctrine is, is that God has given every man the right to profess his own religion, regardless of what it is, publicly, and to try to convince other that, others that he's right. Uh, now, if the Catholic Church is the one true Church established by Christ, can God give men the right to lie about him, to try to mislead others, to try to, to take men away from that religion that he established? There's a contradiction, is what I'm saying. Well, you know, one, one thrust which seems to be coming from these efforts at merging, or rather at ameliorating these tensions between the religions, is that we all worship the same God. Now, isn't this true that all the Christian religions and even Islam worship the same God? No, absolutely. My, my God is a father. He has a son. Mm -hmm. And there is a third person in a holy trinity, Holy Ghost. The second person of the Blessed Trinity became man and died on the cross. Now, if the God of the Mohammedans does not have a son, mm -hmm. if there's not a trinity, then they do not worship the same God? I do. It's mm -hmm. impossible. My God is present in the Holy Eucharist, in the tabernacle. My God 
said, this is my body, this is my blood. My God was crucified for me. Now, if the Jews do not have a God who was crucified for them, then they do not worship the same God I do. <clears throat> if uh, the Protestants do not recognize that Jesus is truly uh, and substantially present in the Blessed Sacrament, and that what is offered at Mass is the sacrifice of Calvary, then they don't worship the same God that I do, because my God is in the Holy Eucharist. Father Jenkins, what was historically the position of the Church on participating in non-Catholic worship? The Church has always condemned this and said that anyone who would participate in non-Catholic worship would be suspect of heresy. And uh, furthermore, the Church even went beyond that. And in her law, she said that if someone were suspect of heresy, and that suspicion endured for a period of time, and the suspicion were not lifted, then one would automatically be branded a heretic. Well, I'll ask you a very direct question, and this is no secret to anyone. Uh, all the time we see intercommunion services. We saw in many cities the bishops will have <coughs> celebrate a Eucharist with Protestants. And to go right to the top, when John Paul II was in the United States, he conducted an ecumenical service, in fact, a Protestant service in South Carolina. No one seemed to get too upset about this. Well, this is the problem. No one gets upset anymore. Um, religion is a matter of taste now, not a matter of truth. It's a matter of individual preference. You like chocolate, I like strawberry. All right, fine. We go to the same ice cream store, we get different flavors. Um, there's no sense of what our Lord said before Pilate, for this was I born, and for this I came into the world, to bear witness to the truth. And those who are of the truth hear my voice. There's no sense of that anymore. Well, one objection I would raise is that can't certain things, can't these relations with non-Catholic religions be changed? It seems that the whole hierarchy is going in this direction. I think this is a... Can the relations between the Roman Catholic Church and the non-Catholic churches be changed? Yes. But the problem is they're trying to change those relations now by changing the Catholic faith. Mm -hmm. That's how they're trying to change the relations. And that is impossible. You cannot change the faith to ingratiate the Catholic religion with anyone. Father, if, if you're one priest and, and you say this is wrong or this is not orthodox, and yet not only does the, the mass of the faithful throughout the Catholic and even Christian world, to use the broader term, but the hierarchy of the Catholic Church itself is going with these, how, how do you, your position almost seems ludicrous. You're one priest and you're saying the Pope's wrong, the bishops are wrong, all the faithful wrong, I'm right. Well, that's not really what we're saying. There are still quite a few bishops who are very good mm -hmm. and still have the faith, no question about it. They're afraid, they're beaten down, they don't know what to do. They're overwhelmed by what's been going on in the church. Uh, there are many Catholic faithful who are extremely uneasy about what's been happening in the church. Uh, I am speaking the teaching of the church throughout the centuries. That's a matter of record. I'm not saying that of pride. Anyone who wants to know can go back and examine what the church has taught. That's all I'm saying. Father, thank you very much for a very stimulating half hour. For what Catholics believe, I'd like to thank Father Jenkins for being with us.